Hi. Um, so our, our first simple questions are like, tell me your name and the title of your piece. Hi, my name is Saul Viegas, and the title of my piece is Deep Sea Coral 3. <laughs> and when did you make the space? I started making this space, uh, I think, towards February. Um, but the adaptation to this project has been an ongoing art and science research project that started in 2019. Oh, wow. So yeah, tell me more about the process leading up to the piece and how, how it ended up in New Art City. Okay, um, well, in 2019, I was approached by a professor at the Institute of Marine Sciences um, at UCSC, and he was looking for artists in the art department to help him with a research project that was supposed to um, show some of his research uh, to the public in a virtual space at the Seymour Discovery Center um, as a virtual exhibit. And so he was sort of trying to uh, look for artists uh, there and he pretty much put a call for artists to go and check it out. And it was just fascinating because I have nothing to do with marine science or science at all. So I was like, you know what, this sounds a little scary, but let me go check it out. And so I walk over to the building and he showed me some of these uh, interesting archives and some visual, you know, video footage of some of the submersible equipment and dives that he had been a part of to sort of collect this data. Uh, and so as soon as I started seeing it, I was like, wow, this is amazing. You know, this is something that you would see like on the Discovery Channel or, you know, like these kind of documentary sort of shows that show the process of how do they, you know, extract these uh, deep sea, you know, um, archives and stuff. And so I say, you know, I, I'm not really uh, knowledgeable at this, but I can see what I can do. And, and so because I love, you know, doing digital imagery, um, I say, you know, just hand me over some archives and let's see what happens, you know, and I, I got some of the footage and images and, you know, I started just playing around with some of the photos on Photoshop. And, uh, you know, I started exaggerating the color and then I pretty much created this series, which was sort of, you know, enhanced and exaggerated sort of just to um, play with the notion of, of how you reimagine archives. You know, I know that the science community is really about like, let's show these uh, factual artifacts in, in the way that they are meant to be. But it was really nice that in the way that Tom Gilderson, who's the professor of the um, you know, uh, Institute of Marine Sciences. And when he approached me, he was saying, Saul, you can do whatever you want with these. I just want some, a, a different adaptation to what we already get to see. So it was really nice that it, from the beginning, uh, I was able to transform these archives into something more imaginative. And so that was the first adaptation to this project. And then the really cool thing for the second part of the Deep Sea Coral, was that uh, there was another call for artists for this Koha Gunderson Speculative Futures Prize at the Humanities Institute. And basically they, the, that cluster uh, at the Humanities Institute was interested in finding artists that can create uh, a speculative world or something that like you can present in a way that reimagined. So it was just so cool that like I was already sort of working on something that tied into that call. So, um, you know, the interesting thing about that is that I then transitioned that series that I did uh, that was a little bit more formal because there was a couple of, of, you know, formalities to show for, for the Seymour Center. You know, I was able to even further that, that project and, and create even more of a speculative approach, which is really nice because then I, I took more of this imaginary sort of immersive space or recollection of, you know, how, if I was that diver, what would that look like to me? And so I kind of recreated that passage. And so that kind of just still landed as a, um, you know, on a web page, and I and I put some of these photographs. But at that time, I didn't have 
the capability, I guess, to sort of take it into an immersive space. So I always kind of imagined that somehow the final adaptation to this would be in this like recreation of, of this story that has been like developing as conversation with, you know, um, uh, professor, at, you know, an oceanographer and all the conversations that we've had through the cluster at the speculative futures, uh, you know, at the Humanities Institute. So it's sort of like a collection of ideas of different, you know, majors and departments. And it's just interesting for me as, as an artist that like these kind of, these kind of conversations uh, pull from so many different angles of imagination. And so for me, it was really important that this next phase, which I'm getting to now that I'm able to sort of encounter with the Deep Sea Coral 3, um, I learned about New Art City through um, a lab on campus called Open Lab uh, Collaborative Research. And Jennifer Parker, who's the founder of that, I, you know, I've done some work with her and uh, through our, you know, art and science collaborations, she was like, you should check this out. They have a call. Uh, and so it was nice because the first, there was a first virtual exhibit that I was trying to figure out how to, you know, use. Uh, I did a um, virtual space called Moderno Mindscapes. And that was nice because I was just sort of able to um, show a new art city in a show that was a collective for last year. Um, to be able to just show my research and in, in some of the imagery that I was doing. Um, and so that was my encounter to New Art City, but this call, I guess, to uh, that was sort of like, hey, like this is sort of an update of, of a solo show, like what, what can you pretty much present? I, I really thought, wow, this is an amazing opportunity that I can uh, revisit New Art City, but also revisit uh, this uh, project that has been ongoing because I feel, that the adaptation to this um, recollection of archives is really important to understand and know as part as a real life research opportunity, but also sort of uh, how I'm able to uh, create work in, for other people to view. That's such a like beautiful narrative. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm, I guess like, I've asked this question of a lot of people who have shown earlier on New, New Art City, like how the pandemic affected their practice. But I'm, I like, I would love to hear kind of, I suppose you hadn't shown in a virtual space before, but can you talk more about how your practice was generally before you met New Art City? Yeah, um, thank you for bringing that up because it was really at the heart of like the pandemic when Tom, who's the researcher that I worked with to do this uh, adaptation of this project, uh, was for a virtual exhibit because there were a lot of institutions, libraries, uh, you know, the exhibit at the Seymour Discovery Center was shut down. So they were still trying to scramble to sort of get information, you know, in some way to um, to view for the public. And so I feel like my practice before then was really heavy on creating digital artwork, you know, enhancing and, and creating sort of catalogs that I would uh, print uh, my work you know, to have as a, you know, um, material that I can then frame and put and view. So really into materials, but I feel like the, the pandemic for me and the way that I design and where virtual worlds really came to be was really the idea that um, everywhere that you went online, there was some sort of 3D sort of photo of, of the, the mapping of a museum. So I feel like museums sort of were like the first ones that I started seeing that were really inspiring, that they were sort of trying to recreate this, this immersive space so that you can sort of walk through these um, tours. So I think that the practice for me was really more manual um, and sort of my art practice has been uh, traditional methods of making artwork through photography, through paintings, and through drawing, and, and sort of the transition in, in archiving that material, trying to make it live somehow in a digitized way, um, is sort of the entry of the portal that I sort of entered into. Uh, how does it look in a VR space? Yeah, that seems like a pretty natural evolution. Um... Yeah, I'm really glad I asked. Um, so um, when was the last time you returned to Moderno Mindscapes? 
uh, you know, I returned to Moderno Mindscapes last quarter because we actually had to show some new work that we were doing as far as like projections or something um, that was new in your in your research. And so uh, I like to focus a lot of like on um, infrared uh, photography aesthetics or uh, after images or, you know, um, perception with um, palinopsia, where you deal with the residue of like after images and sort of the way you you recall imagery in your mind. And so I sort of uh, presented that last quarter. So I revisit it uh, and try not to change it too much just, just because I, I knew that there was already a show uh, that was uh, catered to showing that. And so I, I used it as a presentation. Uh, so that was like really nice because in a real world um, setting, I. I used it as, as part of my uh, critique. And what was it like to return after like some time away? Oh, uh, you know what? It, it was really interesting in the way that I was, um, you can tell that that formalized sort of gallery aesthetic was really pressed on me because I come from a, um, a time where, um, you know, I worked with the master framer and for me materials and archiving objects and putting them into real spaces was really sort of apparent in the way that you saw the, the gallery space. So it made me think like, uh, wow, even though I'm in this immersive space, I was still trying to uh, box things up and, and hang things up in, in, in that way. So I, I felt like uh, revisiting it really sort of um, allowed me to understand the way I think and design um, in the way that I place the objects. I love that. Um, yeah, I mean, these, I keep seeing these being kind of like portals for self reflection, where it's like, you can kind of see what you're thinking more clearly after some time has passed. Um, so like, you've talked uh, about archiving a little bit, but I'm curious to hear more about how you approach archiving in your practice. And like, sort of in a personal sense, like how you return to old work, old work and like maybe in a practical sense, sort of what you, what you do when you, are you encounter it? You know, I think for me, um, the word archive or the idea of an archive really wasn't something that I understood. You know, to me, it was just always, um, I love what I saw in person and the details that you get to see in person, the, that encounter is so direct or sometimes not really so thought of, but it, it's really about when you're trying to explain that to someone else, like how does that, how does that transition to be able to give someone that experience again, or to see in that clarity that you are expecting um, the materials to be in. Uh, and, and I feel like the encounter at the library is sort of where it started, where I was like looking at all, you know, all these like books and special collections. And I'm like, you know, people really went a great deal to make sure that these objects and documents are viewable and that it can sort of spark this, you know, trend of like trying to, you know, find inquiry and wonder in your work. And so for me, it's really about um, how do I create how do I create that in my art practice to start being conscious about uh, making work that will survive longer than, than what I'm making it for? And so I feel like that for me is what Archive has done. It's really um, expanded the way that I've created just to sort of hit um, a lot of marks to maybe give a chance for this idea to sort of continue to live and that it can help inspire people when they encounter it as well. Thank you. Um, so I think that I think that uh, concludes our questions for now. I'm really excited. I don't know if I've actually seen this one, so I'm pretty excited. <laughs> A view into the porthole of deep sea archives from submersible footage provided by the Hawaii Undersea Research Labor Laboratory, Hurl, is recreated from a submersible dive. Visual media of samples from corals and designs from the sea are studied by oceanographers as multi-millennial timescales and serve as paleo recorders of biochemical information. In the virtual adaptation of the submersible dives, the immersible scene is designed to host a library of digitized objects containing these paleo recorders to extract, visualize, and make visible the pathways of archaic knowledge that hold vital information about our environment. 
Using a speculative design approach, a third adaptation to the project Deep, Deep Sea Coral expands to an immersible experience through collaboration with oceanographer Thomas Gilderson. With his guidance and dissemination of research materials and desire to adapt an art and science iteration of the gathering of these paleo recorders, these immersive experience bring awareness to ideas in science that seek to find answers in a vast and unseen environment. Digitally mapping these experiences and creating a space of exploration could help reimagine how we encounter archeological information. By becoming aware of these deep sea corals, user, users can explore the research conducted to extract vital information not easily accessible to the public, leading to more engagement with the broader audience. Designing the virtual world creates a hypothetical scenario in which the participant becomes the researcher by generating interest and curiosity about charts and data that might otherwise be too complex for the non-scientist individual. Creating a space for the public to view anywhere around the world makes it easier for researchers, scholars, and the public to come in contact with these materials by allowing the archives to become searchable and increasing funding and support for academia or academic institutions and research programs. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's really nice to hear more. Um, and this space is so cool. We're inside of a big box and we're looking out. Uh, it seems like we're looking out of the porthole of a submarine at this robot arm. Um, it's kind of this like gunmetal color with like a brassy um, little grabber hand and it's sitting on a coral reef. Um, and we also see a huge radar screen that is the, it, there's and there's like an old kind of windows modal window with two different coordinates that are being plotted in red across this uh, this sort of signature in the radar. And then there's a spherical photo of the same. Oh, no, it's not the same image out of a porthole. It's a different robot arm that seems to maybe be being lowered down or I see another like tube coming off of it, like down to the sea floor. Um, so tell, oh, and there, there's also what seems to be a video feed from one of these remote operated vehicles of, is that like a bandolier of bullets or like an old box of bullets? Yeah, I mean, that's what was really interesting because some of the um, conversations that Tom, Tom was mentioning was that they passed through areas of the North Pacific gyre where, you know, um, Hawaii, where there was all of these um, residues and remnants of like uh world war ii um ships and in things that were just uh floating down there so it was just really interesting to also see um the you know artifacts from like the environment up above and also like the you know artifacts that they're they're researching through the coral so there was a lot of photos um that just had different uh, warheads and guns. And I mean, it was just so interesting. It, it almost seemed like a, a, some scenes of like the Titanic, you know, when you, you're looking at some of the those things. So it made me think of that, but you know, it's really interesting that uh, it was a lot of artillery for, for um, you know, the war. Yeah, it's like, a, it's like a time capsule. So which wall should I go through? <laughs> Yeah, you can go through any of those walls, and uh, basically the way it's set up, uh, it uh, it has. Um, I think you can go through. Yeah, go through that one. And uh, basically, what I was really trying to do, and you can sort of focus in on those boxes. Um, I was really trying to uh, create these uh, immersive spaces so that if you go into one of those boxes. Uh, you can then uh, view the artwork very large and from different perspectives. So you can just really feel um, sort of the the macrocosm of all of these like organisms. You know, every, everything's just, you know, we're so small compared to all of these things that are like, un, you know, not visible in the world. So I really wanted to play with scale and, and play with these archives in, in ways that, you know, you're not seeing them as these like small paintings or small photographs on an um, exhibition that you're able to really, as a like small organism, go in there and kind of see this fast. So sort of taking um, the place of uh, the view of, for say, like the lens of of a creature or of a fish or some 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 other um, non-human 
uh, you know, creature viewing viewing these, and how does that look to them? And so, to me, it was really uh, fascinating to sort of uh, play with that. Um, yeah. Version. So we're inside of this cube, and we see one of the robot arms gripping this little sponge, like red sponge thing, and there's a there's a bunch of fan coral in the background. But zooming out a little, we're on an ocean floor, and there are all of these black pylons, and I see this like great translucent coral structure with like a large image of coral in the back, but we have a ton of these uh, seafloor images represented as cubes on some of the pylons. Um, we can yeah, see if you, some more like submarine footage. There's a lot of like archival material in here. Yeah, and so if you, um, sorry for interrupting, there's a little lag here. If you wanna turn to the left a little bit, um, you know, I, I placed in sort of the landing spot towards your left. And uh, what I liked is that I wanted to put, um, sort of like anchor the, 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 the point where like some of these uh, submarine divers also like go down in some, some other areas where it's not so deep, but they really also play a role in the way that they extract um, some, some of these um, materials that the robotic arm can't, you know? So it's really like, there's like a, a team of like in the way that they extract uh, some of these materials. So I thought it was interesting sort of just to kind of place in uh, a human aspect from it. But like, if you go all the way straight up uh, directly from that box, there's, uh, you know, you're sort of tra traveling through um, sort of the, the the pathway of like what it really, really means when, when they start the excavation. So really like above water and like when you're seeing some of these uh, boxes and the arm and the porthole of like the person that's actually going to like dive down. And so um, it's really sort of like anchoring photos of, of that process. And, you know, of when we, once you come out of that box and there's a projection that I put um, along the side that really um, is uh, the process where they go deep down and, and they're like speaking, they're, they're inside this, um, you know, the submersible equipment. So you get to feel uh, the closeness or the tightness of, of that inside of, of the equipment, which was really interesting to hear Tom sort of, uh, you know, a person that uh, went through that, ex you know, sort of process to go all the way down. He said for, for him that the experience of viewing this virtual world, because I, I showed it to him as a, one of my finals, because um, the important thing was that uh, I did a independent study with him that's connected to the Humanities Institute cluster. And so it's really like expanding on this project. And I said, you know, hey, is, is it okay if we kind of go through the virtual world so you can have a, an experience of, you know, what I designed with your materials. And it was just interesting to, for him to say that it did feel very tight, but that this porthole that you view into that it just seems so vast and that you just don't know when it's going to end. So he said that there are moments in the virtual world when you enter these spaces that give them that same feeling. So that was really interesting to, to hear that um, even though it's an immersive, uh, immersive space, that when you're uh, encountering some of these images and the way that it looks to them, that that feeling of being tightly, you know, inside a space was was real and that in the way that you navigated, um, you know, the seafloor. So I thought that was pretty cool because I've never done that, but I feel like in the way that I was imagining to place these objects that it kind of uh, resonated to some real life scenarios. Right, so to describe the space that we're in right now, we went into a cube at the bottom, which is another view from the inside of a porthole, and we see two divers. One of them seems to have like a spear gun, and the other one has what I think is this like vacuum cleaner thing that can suck stuff up from the seafloor. And one of them is just wearing these like funny Hawaiian like board shorts, and there's another one who's in kind of like full wetsuit gear. And then when we go up through this swirling sphere, then we end up above water and we can see from out the, the little um, robot arm from outside the window. But I really love the way you're dealing with like depth and scale here that it does really it's it feels like it, I mean, simulating the bottom of the ocean can be somewhat difficult in New Art City, but you and you really have to kind of deal with scale. Um, but I think I think you did it in a great way. 
Is there something up here if I keep following? Uh, no, if, if you go structure? down, yeah, no, that one's just meant to sort of uh, add some textures and things like that. But, um, you know, there, there's another, and, and so um, there's another space uh, that I think if you continue to go down, and that's something also that I'm working on to have um, these portal points so that they're labeled and people can, you know, just... Um, pass through and, and navigate or just have fun sort of like exploring um but there is there are other sections where um you know there there's the sort of theater theater space where i feel um in these presentations that we're going to do in real life we can gather uh the people to sort of like hang out in these areas and that there's going to be this uh really neat projection that i uh was from the first adaptation of this project. And it was really nice because there was a lot more literature and, and there was like uh, facts and things that were, you know, sort of guided you uh, through the process that I felt um, really enhanced the experience for me to understand more about like what, what this whole um, extraction of archives and the dissection of, of, of these uh, proteinous uh, coral and why that was important. And so uh, there's another section also in this um, virtual world that houses um, links to Tom's research. And so it's really neat because um, if you navigate sort of uh, when where that area is that we were in when we barely began, there's an area where uh, there's a couple of links uh, and uh, let's see. if you navigate out of there, if you look at it from the bird's eye view, it's not that right there. If you keep going straight forward, there's some really um, nice, especially that nature. Um, yeah, so we have links to a few of these different studies. These are maybe PDFs or web links. Um, and we also have some YouTube videos and these should probably be visible in the catalog also. And so it's really beautiful to see that, um, you know, even though that this space is, you know, fictional, that that there's uh, there's angry moments of, um, you know, photos. I, I was just really uh, excited, and and I really appreciate, you know, Hurl, the Hawaii Undersea Research Laboratory, were very generous with. Uh, especially Megan Poots, who is also the the researcher in that um, organization. She was like, you know. This sounds like a great project and she sent me an index to all of the footage and photos but the thing that was tricky about that it was that um similar to some of these links where you're like what is it or you know there's this index and what do i do with it it was sort of like that for me in the encounter was that i was in you know i encountered this index and i i had to download all of these links because i didn't you couldn't see a preview and so it was really like a beautiful surprise that when all of it like was downloaded that's when the curation started and I started finding all these beautiful gems I'm like oh I need to I need to see these so you know it's it's just beautiful to I guess bring into um conversation of why it's so important for me to put this out here in this way because you know it does come from this in indexed of uh, contact sheet from this research laboratory that pretty much no one would be able to even access if unless you had like some some person that knew a person that knew a person and so it was really sort of like that and and I think that it's just nice to know that in academia there are these pathways that you can sort of uh, extract these um, amazing points of uh, processes for other people that might seem mundane or not important at all at that moment, or that it just seems like a part of the research and it's not, but that you can transform that archive into something that can, you know, not only be inspiring, but that you can learn from. And so to me, it was really, it kind of does a little bit of all that. Yeah, I mean, you're sort of making meaning from this like really big collection of objects. That's like, kind of one of the big goals of curation, right? Ooh, this looks kind of like an old anchor or like a radio mast or something. And there are these mm -hmm. little, um, there are a couple of sea creatures that are kind of attached to it. I, can't, I forget what those little tendril ones are that look like ferns. There's some kind of like anemone looking thing on there. And there's another really big macro photo of a, of a coral that looks super iridescent. Mm -hmm. and that's um, one of my favorite ones that that one's like, 
uh, sort of the viewing room where you can just like go in and you know not think about it. You can just have a relaxing space and take in this like bioluminescent sort of sculptural garden. And so it was a really nice spot just to sort of get away from from some of the other like uh, you know modern devices that I kind of wanted to um, call attention to sort of the serenity that surrounds the the vast sea with all these beautiful um, you know coral and spaces. I didn't realize it was bioluminescent and we also have a, a sculpture of a coral that's like translucent in the center of the space. Now we're yeah we're inside of a giant cube picture of of the iridescent coral. So I see the radar screen again and I see more of these archival images on the on the posts. Um, where should we go to yeah. next? You know, I think that um, that's sort of, uh, you know, what the exhibit was about. I think that um, for now, this is something that, um, you know, has been designed to sort of address the real archives, the photographs, and some some projections. Um, but I, I would say that, that that's the completion of what I have for this uh, adaptation. And I'm hoping that as, uh, you know, I continue to, um, get grants and other people to collaborate on this project that it continues to grow and that I keep adding some some newer work to it. But I think that for for this time around, this is what I got to present for New Art City. And th thank you and thank you, uh, New Art City, for giving me the opportunity to show. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's really nice to hear you speak to the work, um, and I'm really glad. It's like I'm also I'm seeing this space for the first time, so that was really fun. <laughs>